bright colors and and it's a very well done scene. And now all the music again is Tchaikovsky, so it's a world renowned, famous um, composer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's ironic is the scene you talked about with Mickey, which comes after Act Three, uh, when Mickey says hello. At the time in 1940, it would have been Mickey who was honored to be standing with Tchaikovsky. However, in today's day and age, Tchaikovsky would probably be honored to be standing on a stage, quote unquote, with Mickey. Because Mickey's become that iconic at this point in life. Um, now, section two is, is one of my more, more favorite scenes in the, in the movie because he plays the Nutcracker. And the most interesting part of the Nutcracker is everybody knows it because it's somehow strictly tied to, to Christmas, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Um, I don't know if it was intended that way. I assume it was because Nutcrackers are a thing of Christmas, but it might be that this got tied to Christmas and that's how Nutcrackers got in, but whatever. Um, I don't know the history of that. However, in the scene where the conductor was talking about the music, he said, nobody plays this anymore. 1940, nobody would play the Nutcracker. And now you can't go through a Christmas season without hearing it every day. It's absolutely amazing. It was, I mean, it was in Home Alone. It's, it's, they use it for um, Saks Fifth Avenue's light display on their building. It's everywhere. It's, it's at the Rockettes. It's everywhere at Christmas. And in 1940, it was nowhere, which I find amazing. Yeah, that's that's a shocker because, like you said, there's things that are iconic um, when you talk Christmas. And the Nutcracker, you're absolutely right, the Nutcracker is one of them. And, you know, listening and watching Fantasia, like I knew the song. I think there was only two songs out of the suite that I didn't know, but I knew the, the beginning. Right. And I knew the end. And those are the two famous ones that I know that I associate with when you drive in uh, down your street and you see Christmas uh, lights on houses during Christmas or you have a block that's dedicated. Like we have out here in Vegas, uh, we have what's called Opportunity Village. And there are certain houses in this village that you drive through and they do have this music that's playing. Right, and and we have it here in New York too. You have certain towns that are very big on it. Um, you have an area of Brooklyn that everyone does something, you know. So a lot of people go there to that area, um, and like you said, th- this music and other other famous Christmas music. But you're hearing, I'm guaranteeing you're hearing Nutcracker. So the breakdown of that is um, you have Nutcracker uh, Suite, right? And you have a couple versions of it. So you have first you have the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy. That's the one you were talking about, which the spiritual ancestor of uh, Tinkerbell, most likely. Yes. Then you have the Chinese dance. Then you have the dance of the reed flutes, right? Now, this this departs from Nutcracker and does the dance of the reed flutes, but then it goes back to Nutcracker for an Arabian dance, a Russian dance, and the waltz of the flowers. Now, the waltz of the flowers is the part I like probably the most because this is the one, um, if I'm not mistaken, where... The flowers that are eventually going to be in Alice in Wonderland are coming by in rows, and this is one of the ones I love. Now, my daughter also just started doing dance this year, so she just started ballet and tap dance. So it's even cooler to watch something like this with her because she sees, like, her dance in there, you know what I mean? Like, and now I'm watching it through the eyes of a six-year-old dancer, you know? Yeah, and then... And just wait, you know, I'm pretty sure Christmas is just around the corner, so you'll they'll be doing a Nutcracker, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, after the Nutcracker is over, and we have all the great, the Chinese dance, the Arabian dance, the flowers, the Russian dance, you know, which is cool because we get to see all these different cultures at a time where TV wasn't very accessible to a lot of people. 1940, you know, TV was not accessible. You had to go to the movies, and not everyone could go to the movies, but this is a way for other people to get, you know, just some knowledge of these other cultures and they're seeing it through an animated characters, you know, bring these, these cultures to life for them. Then we, we step out of the, the cultural phenomenon and we see um, the most famous of scenes from all of Fantasia, which is the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where Mickey, you know, sees the sorcerer, he grabs the hat, he wants someone else to do his chores and, you know, everything goes awry, um, <laughs> which is the uh, basis of my tattoo because I have Mickey on top of the rocks. The water's not going all the way up, but it's the, you know, it's the premise that counts here. You know what I was going to say, watching The Sorcerer's Apprentice and you mentioned with the broomstick, um, it kind of takes me back to 
the latest Star Wars, uh, the latest Star Disney Star Wars movie that released, uh, at the point where at the end, you have the young Jedi, or who we perceive as the young Jedi, that are in this area, and they have the the little 1940s hats. They kind of look like 1940s paper boys and yeah. girls, and he uses the Force to sweep the broom back and forth on the floor. Yes. And, you know, watching that scene, that's all I can think of. And I'm like, how Disney is Star Wars now? Because they have this. Now, I may be the only one who thinks it. No, there'll but... be someone else now that they heard you say it will think it. <laughs> <laughs> see, when I see, because when I see The Sorcerer's Apprentice, what I think is, um, well, besides the movie, but, it, you know, extrapolating on that, I think Hollywood Studios, because out in the front of Hollywood Studios, before you get enter the gates, you know, where the ticket booths are, mm-hmm. there's actually a statue of Sorcerer Mickey surrounded by the brooms with pails. You know, it's, oh, it's a picture okay. location. So I think of that. When I see the statue, I think of Fantasia. Also, at, F- at Hollywood Studios, they have Fantasmic, which is Sorcerer Mickey's stage show. It's not based on this movie. He's based on this movie, but he does magic and it brings to the life a lot of different characters from different movies. And it's a really awesome stage show. If you go to Disneyland, they have it there too. Um, you have to see it. If you go, you have to see it. I'm telling you, you have to see it. Yes. It is it is their best stage show and firework event in Disney, in my opinion. Um, just to the point where I spent 11 tries trying to get in and see it through my life before finally seeing it. Uh, because of rain or whatnot happened uh, almost every time it got rained out as I was sitting in the seat waiting for it to start. But um, so... And then when I obviously when I see that I think Fantasia because it's based on Fantasia. It's a big rock formation. Mickey's up there. He has to eventually he ends up defeating, um, I believe Maleficent. Yeah, but I mean that's that's a departure from the Sorcerer's Apprentice. But the point is he comes out and he is the Sorcerer's Apprentice at one point in this thing. Yeah, I my trip. I only had one trip to Disneyland, uh, as I had said. I think I had said in the intro podcast. Um, but the fireworks show, yeah, you could see it from where we were staying. You could see the fireworks show. Uh, we had gone in early for some reason, but, you know, talking about this makes me want to go back to Disneyland, not just for the aesthetics, which they do every season, but to actually sit and analyze while still feeling like a kid and still having fun, but analyze each section of the park yeah and you're picking next year would be a good time to do it you yes. know like because now you have you have all the areas opened to you and uh there's just so much there um so we have right of spring that's the next one and that leads us into i don't which one was right of spring was that the one right before the intermission right before the intermission yeah that's the one yeah uh i don't really remember what happens in that one though i i I think that was just a lead-in to the intermission. I don't think... Might have been. But that's when Mickey also says to Sikorsky, you know, I just want to congratulate you. Yes. Shakes his hand. Uh, we then have the right of spring. We then have the... Ah, you know what? I think I'm wrong. Sorcerer's Apprentice led into the... Yes, I got that wrong. I'm sorry, listeners. Sorcerer's Mickey leads us into... The intermission, um, Rite of Spring, is when they have the waveform with all the different notes played on the different instruments. Yes. So, And that's that's something that I never knew was in Fanta- Fantasia. Um, however, it plays on like Disney's uh, in-house TV on their hotels and their cruise ships all the time. Really? Uh, yeah, all the time. It used to. Uh, now they're playing more of the new Mickey stuff, but they used to play all the time. So I've seen it a million times or so. Oh, wow. um, and I never realized it was part of this, <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah. It, it's, again, you know, you're never too old to learn and you're never too old, especially when, as we're talking, we're associating it with, with this movie with future of Disney, uh, therefore, and you're never too old to learn. You're never too old to experience, uh, anything. And I think, um, Though I should have saved that for my closing remarks, I just wanted to put that out there that 
it's amazing what people do in marketing for Disney, like you said, Disney Cruise, Disneyland, Disney World, to invoke happiness, and this is the start of it. This is the genesis. Yes, this is the the early, early on. Now, I know you said start, so we'll let the listeners know. We do understand this is not the first movie Disney did, but this yes. is the beginning. There's you, you can't make one hit and become a legend. So, you know, there was a bunch of them before Disney became a legend. And remember, at the time, pe- people didn't believe in animation. So Disney was using the ballet and, all, and the classical music to legitimize his field. He was legitimizing animation, and he was using some of the greatest tactics I've ever seen to legitimize something like this. At the time, everyone sat around a radio. So what does he use? He uses music. And, and that's something, especially like you said, that that would draw the people in and using animation. And I can only imagine how long... It took this movie to be made in the 1940s, hand drawn. Timing, you know, t- the timing, and, and the time to put in, and the timing. It's not like you can draw a flip book like we used to do when we were kids, and and put it together in two seconds. I mean, this is a pretty large flip book, right? And now I can take video, load it into my computer, pick a song, hit a button, it times the movements to the song. Right? right? I do that all the time. It does it with GoPro. Um, it'll take the clips I use, cut them up so they fit the right beat to the... That didn't exist in 1940. This was... Uh, that that Mickey needs to be on an upbeat right there because that's an upbeat in the song. You have him at a downbeat. Change the whole thing. You know, one little change is days or weeks worth of work just to get the timing right on the the, the visuals to the audio. Yeah, and it's it's definitely not a one trick pony, uh, like we were saying. There's timing involved, and even again, you watch the animation, you listen to the music, and it the crescendos, it's ebbs and flows, and it just melds so perfectly that you have to sit and wonder. Oh my god, yeah. I, I truly did enjoy this movie um, immensely. Uh, I'm glad I saw it. I wish I saw it when I was younger to relive it, but there's reasons for everything, listeners, and and this is one of those, one of the examples of the cliche. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So then we also have the pastorals, and we have uh, none of which I can say at all. Um, (laughs) Allegro Manon Tropodo on... Andante. Andante molto mosso. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, my seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade Italian teachers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know Italian at all. I studied Spanish, and I'm not even that good with that. But uh, you know, so we have these coming in. Now we have we have one of the more iconic characters that came out of this that wasn't Mickey Mouse. We end up having um, Peter Pegasus. That's the little black and white Pegasus that. So if you follow Peter Pegasus past this movie or if you read into his motions and stuff, all Peter Pegasus wants to do is fly really well like Mommy and Daddy. What's I, what's what's also nice about Peter Pegasus is he's the only one who looks like Mommy and Daddy. They have a blue, they have a pink, they have an orange, right? And then they have a black and white. But the parents are – the the father is fully black um, Pegasus and the mother is a fully white Pegasus. So he's the only one who actually takes on the color – characteristics of his parents and uh and it's just so beautifully done the 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 flying is a beautiful um work of ballet basically i mean they weren't doing ballet per se but that's what it was mirrored after in in reality um and so we see this and we, we we see the them floating down into the water or they come around and they go through the little waterfall and it was just, in my opinion, he's one of the more iconic characters. And you also can see a lot of the... Uh, at first, I was a little annoyed because when um, when they're describing the scene, he goes, he's talking about the Pegasus, and then unicorns show up in the beginning of the scene when the, the little cherub is playing. It's a cherub, right? Yeah, he's playing yeah. the the uh, that little instrument that cherubs the, play. The harp. The harp-ish? Or the, was he playing yeah. the harp? No, yeah, in the beginning he was playing the harp, but in the end he's playing the little flute one. Oh, yeah, pipes. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when that, you know, but 
so you see unicorns. I'm like, those aren't Pegasus. Pegasus have wings. Unicorns have horns. Like, mm-hmm. I know because my daughter watches My Little Pony. But uh, 